much. I really appreciate your leadership um, and, uh, and bringing all of us together. Chris and there's Sarah. Thank you so much for opening this wonderful space for all of us to gather today. And thank you all for coming. This means a lot to me. Um, I wanted to start uh, out by just talking about how pivotal Wisconsin is in this. We have an election next Tuesday. Don't forget that. There's some great local candidates running for incre incredibly important positions. And I, I always remember that uh, phrase, all politics is local. Um, it matters. So participate next Tuesday. But when I look to November, um, I think about uh, what a battleground state we are. I think about the fact that we may very well decide here in Wisconsin who our next president is, what party controls the United States Senate. We might even contribute to flipping the House of Representatives right here from the state of Wisconsin in the third congressional district. Um, and I also just want to say uh, a word about the victory we've had in getting fair maps and ending a long era of gerrymandering in the state of Wisconsin. Wherever I travel, and, and thanks for uh, pointing out the fact that I do like to get around. I'm on my Dairyland tour. I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Um, but I think having fair maps will mean that people will see an opportunity to serve, to get out there, and we will have a lot more activity um, door to door where it really counts, doing the work that you do people about what their issues are, listening, and then contrasting the candidates on the very issues that people are, uh, care about. Um, that's how, how we win elections. But anyway, so quickly, the Dairyland tour. Uh, I, I'm on my Senate spring break, if you will, this week, and we're going to, in the end, put about 1,400 miles on the automobile. Um, I started at Superior. We'd had a mild winter, thought it was a great place to kick it off, and then they have the biggest snowstorm of the entire season, right? And uh, so when I arrive in uh, Superior, they had taken down the event that we put together because schools were closed and everything. Um, so I went to greet the snowplow operators. <laughs> we brought them donuts after their 12-hour shift on the road and thanked them for keeping us all safe. because. They were the front line in that particular moment. But anyways, it's been wonderful to travel around the state and, and listen and exchange. Um, but with Battleground State, uh, Republicans have gotten their top pick in their uh, recruitment efforts for a candidate against me. Uh, California bank owner, Eric Hovde, is um, somebody who can bankroll his own campaign. And that's partly why he was recruited, so that they wouldn't have to raise money for him, that he could simply write the check. And he announced his candidacy last month, and within days, launched campaign advertising statewide. Wrote the $3 million check for that first few weeks, right out of his own checkbook. Uh, and so, got our work cut out for us. But I would suggest to you that there's another reason why uh, they are after me as a U.S. Senator. And that's because I've never been afraid to stand up to powerful interests. And you know what? Sometimes I win. Sometimes we win. And I want to tell you a few of those stories. So for those of you who don't know, I was, um, my mother was 19 years old when I was born. She was going through a divorce. And throughout her life, she struggled with mental illness. She struggled with physical illness. And she also struggled with addiction to the narcotics that she was prescribed for her physical conditions. She moved back in with her parents when I was born. And I was raised by my maternal grandparents. They were there for me stability, love. I was so fortunate to have them. 
Um, when I was nine years old, I developed a very serious childhood illness similar to spinal meningitis. I was in the hospital for three months. And my grandparents had health insurance, but they realized I was not their legal dependent. So they said, let's fix this. Let's try to find her health insurance. And they shopped all around. Nobody, nobody, no company would insure me. Because they could do that back then. They could simply say no. And they did. I didn't have health insurance until I was a young adult, and it was offered through my employment. I grew up watching my mother's struggles and watching my grandparents worry. And I felt it was wrong. And I believe that we need a healthcare system that's universal, that covers everyone, that we can all afford, that's high quality. And, and I knew that was my fire in the belly. That's why I got involved in public service. Now, you might wonder why did I start with the county board? Well, actually, back then, we dealt with a lot of health issues at the county level. I think we still do a bit, but back then it was very uh, strong involvement. But anyways, imagine those years later, I was in the House of Representatives on the committee writing the Affordable Care Act. And boy, did we get lobbied by those big, powerful health insurance companies. Don't do this, don't do that. But we wrote into that law, and we told them, you cannot discriminate against somebody because they've been sick before, they have a pre-existing condition. You cannot discriminate because somebody has diabetes, or somebody is HIV positive, or somebody is a survivor of cancer. You cannot discriminate anymore. And you can't, for women used to be charged more. The premiums were higher. You can't do that anymore either. And then my amendment, I have to brag about my amendment, um, I offered an amendment that allows young people to stay on their parents' health insurance until they turn 26. It's law now. And, and when that bill was implemented overnight, millions of people, young people, who hadn't had insurance for the first time had it. You can stand up to those powerful interests and win. But I want to give you a much more recent example of that in healthcare, and that is standing up to the big pharmaceutical companies. You know, they set the list price. Whatever they may say uh, to low point the finger somewhere else, it's this folks, that folks, they set the list price. And the list price for medications here in the United States is often tenfold higher than it is in other places. You know, you might know somebody who fills their prescription through Canada or Mexico for that very reason. Two years ago, we passed a bill called the Inflation Reduction Act. We finally stood up to the big pharmaceutical companies and now Medicare is negotiating with those companies for the first time to bring down the cost of life-saving medications. And now, they started with 10. These are drugs that treat hypertension and cancer and diabetes. Follow that will be 10 more and 10 more. I'd like to see 100 more. I think the president agreed when he gave his State of the Union address. So we think we can hasten that once they get the hang of it. But in the meantime, in the Inflation Reduction Act, we capped the out-of-pocket cost for insulin at no more than $35 per month. A game changer for people with diabetes who rely on insulin. And for most seniors, vaccines are now free. Cost will not be a, a, a barrier to getting the sort of immunizations that people need. Um, and I want to give an example of a very recent victory that I'm very proud of. Um, Bernie Sanders and I and a couple of our colleagues launched an investigation into the um, high cost of asthma inhalers. The list price in the United States of asthma inhalers is somewhere between $250 and $650 per inhaler. 
and you usually need one every month. Now, if you have insurance, they pay part of it. You're not, not, most people aren't burdened with that entire price, but they set the list price. And if you go to Europe, the range is somewhere between $5 and say $55 or $60. So our investigation is number one, why are you burdening the US with these high prices when you have low prices and you're getting profits in other countries? This is, and, and secondly, why isn't there competition? Why is there only four companies who are making these inhalers? Why aren't there generic competitors? So we asked those questions, and about a month later, one of the major manufacturers announced voluntarily, with all this scrutiny on them, that they would lower the out-of-pocket cost to no more than $35 per month. A couple weeks later, a second manufacturer said exactly the same thing. I held uh, a week ago, not this past Monday, but the Monday before, a round table in Milwaukee with people with asthma, doctors who treat those people with asthma, a pharmacist who was telling stories about his patients not being able to afford what they needed and rationing. Um, and an hour before our round table was to begin, the third manufacturer said, we're gonna voluntarily lower the out-of-pocket cost to no more than $35 an hour, or an hour a month. The, um, the point is that transparency and scrutiny, when you stand up to these powerful companies, you can win, and we are doing that. Now, we've gotta keep them to it, but this is really, really a breakthrough for so many people who rely literally on their inhalers to breathe. Um, I wanna to pivot to a, another story. Um, you know, Wisconsin is known for making things. Cheese. Cheese. <laughs> All sorts of good things. We're a big manufacturing state. You can think of the iconic brands that we make here in Wisconsin. But you know, our industrial policy and our trade policy has led to many of those good paying jobs, those manufacturing jobs, leaving the state over decades. And why? Because if you're a big multinational powerful corporation and you can decide where it is that you're going to make your widget, you might go to a country with no minimum wage laws, no worker safety laws, no environmental protections. You might go to state subsidies, forced labor, child labor, and people have and companies have. So I consider myself the champion in the United States Senate of Buy America policies. Yeah. Right? This is, so, you know, I'm not telling the private sector what to do, I'm just saying that when we're spending our taxpayer dollars, your dollars, I would prefer that they're supporting U.S. workers and U.S. small businesses whenever possible. And I used to fight against those big multinationals. Maybe I'd get a provision that was gonna last a year or two years. Well, in the Biden administration, I've been getting permanent Buy America legis legis legislation through. So in the infrastructure bill, we have permanent Buy America policies. In the Chips and Science Act, permanent Buy America policies. In the Inflation Reduction Act, which is investing so heavily in renewable and clean energies, we have Buy America, we're gonna start making the components here. Uh, but I wanna share one example of what that means for a state like Wisconsin. So last year, I joined the Commerce Secretary, uh, Gina Raimondo, in, uh, in Kenosha, Wisconsin. We were at a company called Sanmina. Um, they were announcing that they were gonna double their workforce from 200 to 400, double the footprint of their factory, and the reason was Buy America policies. So we are doing a, an enormous broadband build out in this country. It was authorized by the And the Secretary of Commerce came to a company overseas and said, we need your circuitry for this build out. But you don't, I can't buy it because you don't make it in America. 
And they said, yeah, that's not our business model. We don't. She said, well, you're going to be losing a lot of business if you don't figure out a way. Well, they figured out a way. They figured out that San Mina had a skilled labor force and did similar work. They licensed the circuitry to a Kenosha company. And now we have 200 new good paying jobs coming to our state because of Buy America policies. It's great. <laughs> um, the last thing I wanted to talk about is standing up to another powerful group, I'll call it. A little bit more amorphous than identifying big pharma or big health insurance or big multinationals. And those are the extremists. The ones who, for years, have been figure, trying to figure out a way to take step backwards on our rights and our freedoms. The folks who plotted for years of how to overturn Roe versus Wade. You know, I think of America as a country that has recognized rights and freedoms and we're always going in the forward direction. And when the Dobbs decision came out, stripping away the rights of half of Americas so they have fewer rights than their parents and grandparents. It's a gut punch for everybody. And for some, for some, it's been a harrowing, harrowing experience. But we're not just seeing it with regard to the Dobbs decision, we're seeing books being banned. We're seeing curriculum being uh, altered. We're seeing it in our communities. You know what I mean. When the Dobbs decision came out, I read it, I'm a lawyer, wanted to be fully informed of what their conclusion was. And basically, for lay people, the decision says that Dobbs, Dobbs says that Roe versus Wade was decided wrongly in the first instance. That the Supreme Court was recognizing some sort of right to privacy that didn't exist, this is what they're saying. He said, the word privacy does not appear in our US Constitution. So there couldn't be a right to privacy if you take it literally, right? So it makes you think about what other cases were decided based on a right to privacy. Well, those cases include Loving versus Virginia, the case that struck down a Virginia statute that criminalized interracial marriage. It includes cases like Griswold versus Connecticut, the right to privacy, right to be able to access contraception. It includes cases like the more recent Obergefell case, which allows same-sex couples to have marriages recognized. So if they decided that there wasn't a right to privacy, all those other cases were in jeopardy. And if it weren't enough that it was implied by that majority opinion, it was actually stated outright in Clarence Thomas's concurring opinion. Well, he left out interracial marriage. <laughs> but he named contra this contraception case, and he named uh, Obergefell. And he basically was inviting folks to relitigate. Let's bring it back, these things, before this Supreme Court, newly composed with the three uh, confirmed under President Trump. People, people were terrified at this moment. What does this mean? What does this mean for our marriage rights that we fought so hard for? And so the Respect for Marriage Act. The way I would have you uh, understand that is that it was like an insurance policy that should a future Supreme Court overturn the Loving versus Virginia case regarding uh, interracial marriage or overturn the Obergefell case relating to same-sex marriage, that this bill, the Respect for Marriage Act, would say that your 
legally recognized marriage, prospectively and retroactively, would be recognized by the federal government and in all 50 states. So I'm telling you this story because when we introduced the bill in the wake of Dobbs, I was told, you don't think you can actually pass that, do you? <laughs> and I said, just you watch. Now remember, you need 60 votes to pass anything in the United States Senate, not just a simple majority. And this was a deeply divided time, Dobbs just having come out. And people were very skeptical. But I literally, for weeks and weeks and weeks, talked to one Republican after another. And we figured out they had loved ones that were impacted by this. They went to church with people who were impacted by this. They had staff members who were impacted by this. And one by one, now I needed 60, but then nobody wants to be identified as the deciding vote for something. So in the end, we got 12 Republicans and we passed the Respect for Marriage Act and we stood up to those extremists. Now, we have a lot of work left to do. You know, Wisconsin was devastated by the Dobbs decision. For 15 months, there was no access to care at all in the state. Now there's been the resumption in three counties, but we have 72 counties. We cannot let this persist for like the 49 years that it took them to overturn Roe versus Wade. So I am the lead author of the Women's Health Protection Act, which would restore reproductive rights. It would codify Roe versus Wade and take the additional and necessary steps of telling states like Wisconsin, you can't pass a bunch of state level laws that encumber and burden these rights. And we must nine years to win these rights back. I don't have 60 votes yet, but I do have a plan. <laughs> and um, I will continue to fight so that we restore ourselves as a nation that advances rights, that advances freedoms, and doesn't contract. Um, let me close with just how um, moved I am by everyone who showed up. You know what the stakes are. Everything I just talked about, my opponent, we, we know his record because he ran once before in 2012. I uh, came in second to Tommy Thompson in that primary, who I ultimately won. But he said in that campaign in 2012 that he was 100% opposed to abortion rights. He said that he would commit himself to try to overturn the Affordable Care Act. Eric Hovde, my opponent, he has talked about raising the retirement age and limiting uh, uh, the benefits of Social Security and Medicare. He even has favored and endorsed a tax plan that would lower the taxes for multimillionaires like himself while raising taxes on working people. These things are all on the ballot, plus our very democracy. You know how close we came to losing it. I was in the Capitol on January 6th. A violent insurrection ensued. We have folks who deny the outcome of the last election. Those issues are all on the ballot this November. Thank you for your willingness to talk to your neighbors, to get out there and tell your friends. And I uh, thank you so much for recognizing what's at stake and being here today. I stand on your shoulders every day. Thank you. <laughs>